some zombies were just people who looked like they were fresh from a funeral parlor, made up real pretty like a mortician would do, and he walked around in a nice business suit. And, you know, so, yes, we did try to think of uh, making them look like people who had died in great ways, you know, great ways, yeah. How do you die in a great way? Interestingly, visceral, gory ways, you know. <laughs> writing a script, I'll talk to Tom and I'll say, hey, you know, have you dreamed up anything in the last few weeks that you really want to try? And I'll write it in. Uh, that kind of stuff, you know. We just have this sort of uh, giggly time uh, dreaming stuff up together. A person listening to our conversations, it would have been incredible, you know. But for us, it's something that we do every day. I mean, I look around you, there are severed heads, there's people with their faces melted up. And for us, it's an art. It's a you know, there's a lot of sculpture and all of it. Most people, when they see the film, they just see gore. They just click into the gore and they don't realize how much sculpture and mechanics, photography and mechanisms and chemistry goes into it. Like it just like it the way people like roller coaster rides and if you like it and if you're a fan of it you can't get enough of it and you want to see it well executed and Tom is one of those guys that is executing it well and so I think that's why people are you know in love with the films I mean he has his own fans that will go see a Tom Savini film you know not caring about who the director is or who the writer is or who any of the other people are. Um, and I you know that's the group I haven't examined it to find out whether there's a real sociological reason, but I've always just sort of thought of it something that's sort of come up with rock and roll and with punk and with this uh, attitude of let's, you know, sort of fart on the establishment or something. And it's always been part of that subculture. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess I, I don't think of it quite as, irreverent, as irreverently as some of those things. But to me, it's, it's part of, it's Grand Guignol. You know, it's, it's, there's always been a, a part of some people's minds, I think, that are sort of tuned into it, you know. Roger! In the great British tradition of Jim will fix it, I've decided to exploit my position on this program in order to fulfill a boyhood ambition. Tom Savini has graciously agreed to make me up as a zombie. Tom, where do we begin? Well, let's begin by slapping this little bit on your face here. Lovely. Got some adhesive in there. And we'll just position it. You're all done. See you later. OK, Tom, thanks a lot. <laughs> OK, now we'll just continue. Okay. I haven't worn one of these for weeks, Tom. process was neither as painful nor time-consuming as I'd expected, taking only about 20 minutes. And there you have it, a remarkable improvement, even if I do say so myself. I know you, you served in Vietnam for a while. Mm -hmm. Did that have any effect on, on the work you do now? Is that any influence in any way? Um, I get asked that question a lot. Um, 
In fact, one, one magazine said that my whole uh, uh, is, is, is based on my experiences in Vietnam, and that's not true. I was interested in makeup, as you know, from the age of 12. I did see a lot of firsthand anatomically correct gore, you know, and I think the most important part of that was if we have to create a dead body or create a, a situation, there's a certain feeling you get from seeing the real thing that can't be achieved. I mean, you can, there's, one guy can make a fake head or a fake body and position it somehow. But there's something about uh, what I saw, uh, the, the cadavers. For example, you ever see a movie where someone's about to die and they're talking, they're, they got their last cigarette and someone's holding the rough and, you know, they're, they're all screwed up, you know, and they're about to die. And then when they die, they, they turn their head and close their mouth and achieve this peaceful countenance, you know. You know, you, come, you relax, your jaw hangs slack, you might even drool, you know. That's, from seeing the real stuff, you know, that's what makes it different. You know, there's a certain body positioning. I mean, someone might die with one eye open and a smile on their face, you know. And, uh, or someone might die in this frozen, scared position, you know. You don't just close your mouth and achieve this angelic appearance, you know. So I think having seen the real thing, if, if I'm creating a gory effect and it doesn't give me the same feeling that I felt when I saw the real stuff, I'm not satisfied. Throughout his career, Romero has worked almost exclusively here in Pittsburgh. And like all regional filmmakers, his chosen town has heavily influenced his work. There's always been a sort of an ethic and a reality to the place. I mean, people don't lie about much here. You know, it's the things are the way they are. And it's, it's just part of that. It's a part of the American heartland that's, I guess, similar to the farmland. Only it's the other side of, of uh, you know, it's the other side of commerce. It's that industrial strength that this country used to have. It's a thing of the past, but uh, it's still reflected in the muscle of, the, of the, the kind of people, I think, that live in places like this. The final film in the Dead trilogy was initially intended to be an epic. It was going to be the Gone with the Wind of zombie films. George wanted to take the story of the undead about as far as he possibly could. But to raise the money needed to make a film of that scope, he would have had to cut back on the gore and violence, something he wasn't prepared to do. Instead, he pared down the script and made a much smaller, more economical film. But even so, to my mind, The Day of the Dead is still the most gruesome, visceral and intense of all three films. of not necessarily the last but but one of, of probably several nests of humanity that are left it was a military group they were there for research um, and of course now the need for what they're doing is is all but gone because with society gone you know who are they going to report to if they find anything out and all of a sudden when the, that structure is gone they don't quite know how to behave or they cling to old behaviors and no one talks to each other and nobody communicates and there's this sort of tragedy about the, uh, the lack of, of human communication causing chaos and causing uh, a general a collapse of, of even this small um, uh, little pie slice of, of, of society. Mm -hmm. 